Walter Russell Mead is uh, the Ravenel B. Curry III Distinguished Fellow in Strategy and Statesmanship at Hudson Institute, uh, the Global View columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and the James Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities at Bard College. Before joining Hudson, uh, Mr. Mead was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations as the Henry Kissinger Senior Fellow for U.S. Foreign Policy. He's authored numerous books, uh, including The Ark of a Covenant, the United States, Israel, and the Future of the Jewish People. Uh, Walter, thank you so much for joining us here uh, today. Uh, a lot has happened in the last 24 hours, even. Uh, Israel's defense minister came out in opposition to judicial reform, uh, and the prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu, fired him. And response, the country is now engulf engulfed in turmoil. So I'd love to get your response to these events, uh, specifically, what's most surprising to you, what's most concerning for you? Okay, well, I mean, to begin with, um, uh, it's easy for foreigners to have opinions about judicial reforms in other people's country, but it's actually hard for those opinions to have any value or add any value. When you ask me, you know, what is the proper role of a Supreme Court in a country that doesn't have a written constitution, and where the framework of laws is different from what I know in the U.S., I really don't have a lot to say. So um, I tend to look at it uh, just more as a as a political uh, question. And there, I, you know, there what I see is, you know, I'm I'm. It's less about the details of the particular arguments that people are having now, and more about the problem of sort of two visions of what Israel is or ought to be that are in contention. And so it, it seems to me that this is really a, a moment of state building or worst case, you know, state devastation that um, uh, you've got a sort of on the one hand, you've got the kind of you know, the, the Israeli society that for many of us foreigners typifies Israel, that is um, often from originally from European origins, uh, often uh, not always pretty secular, fairly liberal in political outlook, grounded in major institutions. Um, and then you have another Israel that is more Mizrahi, I suppose, in origin, typically, somewhat more religious and traditional, uh, has more children uh, than the other Israel, but doesn't uh, necessarily produce as many economic goods, or in fact, play the same kind of role in the security services. So, you know, that, that raises real questions of uh, who gets to decide what Israel is and how it works. Uh, what do you do in a sense if the if you get an electoral majority or an effective ruling coalition whose political base is at odds with the instincts of the people who built the state? Uh, I'm not, you know, that again is a question as a foreigner and someone who's not Jewish. I really, you know, don't have the answer to that. Uh, but I think, and I, and I wrote about this in my Wall Street Journal column, I think last week, it, it did remind me of sort of what Ben-Gurion had to face at the time of the War of Independence and afterwards, where his first time, I mean, in addition to defending the nascent state from, you know, outside attack, he also had to ensure the supremacy of state authorities over all sort of political militias and political groupings in the country, which meant both, you know, crushing right-wing militias that were trying to get arms and organize independently the state, but also forcing the Palmach leadership into the regular army hierarchy, again, establishing the supremacy of the state over all other forces in Israel. Uh, and that that meant he both he had to attack both his supporters and his political rivals to do it. Then afterwards, when it comes to trying to figure out how Israelis are going to live together, the question that that we're now looking at of how these two Israels coexist in the in the same state, um, Ben Gurion 
sort of surprised and annoyed many of his strongest supporters by giving a larger role to the religious than perhaps strictly their numbers or their power in society would have given them. So you have, you know, to this day, the very strong religious role in the courts and civil law and all of these things, exemptions from military service, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of these decisions that Ben-Gurion made are uh, remain extremely controversial to the present day, either among historians or just politically. Um, I think, and, and while one can say, well, he should have done a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, it does seem to me that the achievement of building the state is ultimately in part due to, his, to all of these very controversial and difficult decisions. That seems to me what a leader in Israel would need to try to think about today at this level of it can't be one side finally defeating the other. Uh, it, it it has to be, OK, what does a society and a government look like that all of the people who who are here can feel loyal to and engaged with? And so what do you think at this moment Bibi Netanyahu can do to achieve that? It's hard to tell. You know, I've I've met him a few times. I imagine I'm not the only person in this room who has. And, you know, my impression is that he is um, shrewd and ruthless, which are probably at the moment good things to be. Um, to the extent that I, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to to interpret a debate that's happening in a language that I don't speak in a country that I don't live in. So uh, I don't, you know, I want to be careful here. But if, as I read the situation, he genuinely believes strongly and deeply that he is the person who is most capable to lead the nation of Israel at a time of existential peril abroad, let's not forget what's happening with Iran and the sort of constant reshuffling of the region and at home. He does not think that anybody else is in his, you know, has this ability, having been the prime minister longer than anyone in Israel's history and having in his own mind a very strong track record of success. He feels that while he's not a religious person, I think he feels in a he feels a kind of a sense of historical destiny, and therefore, in his mind, whatever it takes to defend his position as prime minister is legitimate and necessary, and you know, and so he he holds his position because he thinks it is the best for everyone. Can quarrel with that assessment. Many people do, but I think that is honestly how he feels. He feels things are, um, and so he. I think he's he's come to power at the head of a coalition he doesn't like very much, uh, and he would probably rather have almost any other coalition than the one he's got. But it is the one he's got, and partly because of the degree to which he's alienated other people who in political terms, he could probably live with. It's the only coalition he's likely to have, at least for a while. So, um, and the coalition has demands that, um, you know, have plunged Israel into crisis and which uh, are, you know, are tremendously polarizing, but they hold to to the view these views with that, extremely annoying tenacity, which one encounters in many places in Israeli life when people are sure they're right, deeply believe it, extremely argumentative, very much in your face. Um, and, and and they're not they're not interested in budging on their core convictions. I think in this situation, he knows again, I'm I'm trying to read the mind of a person I've spent maybe a total of four hours with in my life. So um, again, worth what you're paying for it. Uh, but um, I think he probably thinks that these demands are, in his heart of hearts, these demands are way past what people can reasonably have. But he doesn't think it's his role necessarily to be the educator. 
Um, he's letting reality do the educating. Uh, and I imagine hopes that at some point he'll be able to step in as a kind of a, you know, convince the people in his coalition you're getting you no one under no one else could you get more, but also convince other people that, you know, I can make a deal stick and bring some kind of closure to this situation. I don't actually think he is all that invested in the fine details of what that compromise would look like. Um, you know, there are probably a range of outcomes that he could accept. Um, and he's just, I think at the moment, I think he's rather happy that the attorney general told him for a while he could not intervene. I think that was... Uh, Oh, I would love to say something, but the law prevents it, um, which kind of simultaneously reinforced, I think, the argument that some of the claims that the attorney generals make are 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 over the top. That is that a, a someone who's been appointed by no, elected by no one can tell the elected leader of a country you can't intervene in the most important political event of the country. That, I think, Bibi felt making that point underlines that maybe this isn't a sustainable way for the for a country to be run, but at the same time, obviously, kept him out and got him, you know, out of the game of having to propose this solution, that solution, negotiate with this block, negotiate with that block. So quite convenient. Obviously, now uh, that has moved. He's he's forced to take a more active position. As far as I can tell, and again, this is from a great distance, and I'm busy doing other things. So I'm, you know, the coalition seems to be in a slow and reluctant process of grudging retreat, that it looks more and more as if, you know, they really are going to have to give on some, some of the points. Uh, and so now, in some ways, we're in a haggling process. Now, this may be too optimistic. I haven't been there to be on the street to realize how hot tempers are on both sides. Um, but that's kind of my sense of where things are. And I'd be very happy if somebody could, you know, illuminate me because I really am just guessing in the dark. So we'll, we'll turn to some of the questions from um, our Academy students in a moment, um, but turning more to, to foreign policy and the United States, how do you think this situation, both currently today, but also for the last few weeks, is affecting the U.S.-Israel relationship? Mm. I actually think it's, you know, the U.S.-Israel relationship um, basically depends more than anything else on the relationship of perceived U.S. national interests to perceived Israeli national interests. And the big thing now is that I think the Biden administration believes the best thing for the United States is to have as little exposure in the Middle East as possible. And it also believes, I think, that um, the only thing worse than a nuclear Iran is a war between the United States and Iran in the Middle East. And if we think about, you know, the coalition, again, that President Biden leads, if you're a Democratic president and you lead the United States into a Middle East war, I think you, you really run the risk of breaking the Democratic Party, of certainly of having a very powerful opposition on the left. Um, then if you look simply with what's going on with Ukraine and concerns about China, a sort of third major international commitment from the United States is, is something any American president, I think, would, would definitely try to stay away from. And in Biden's case, again, I think Biden for many years uh, going back in the, and, and by the way, one reason I think the debate over the JCPOA was so bitter in the United States is basically about this, is is Iran's having a nuclear weapon so dangerous to the United to American interests that the United States should be willing, if need be, either to get in a war ourselves over it, or if 
Israel and other countries were to attack Iran uh, to prevent the bomb, and Iran retaliated in ways that forced the U.S. into some kind of Middle East engagement. They're shooting tankers or something or whatever they, they might do. Uh, which, which alternative is worse? Uh, and I think for both Obama and Biden, um, the belief is that the Iranian bomb is not as bad. We've lived with many bad countries, including North Korea, with bombs for a very long time. They haven't used them. And that's how they think of it. Um, so that creates, no matter who's prime minister of Israel and no matter who's president of the United States, if the two countries are on these paths, we have a difficult relationship, um, unless the Israelis were to decide, eh, you know what, the bomb is terrible, but there are worse things. Uh, so we have that. Beyond that, again, the U.S. really, un under the Democrats, really doesn't want to be involved in constructing Middle East order. They see it as painful, ugly, full of bad moral choices. You can't, you know, the Arabs aren't going to democratize, so it can't be like NATO in Europe. Uh, you're going to be hated. You're going to hate yourself. It's just there's nothing good here. And so the best course in the United States is to, you know, do as little as necessary in Europe to keep Russia on the back foot, but focus much more on China. Um, and I think that has a lot more to do with what goes on in the relationship than like news stories that pop up here and there. Uh, so. You know, if if hypothetically the current gov there's new elections and the government is replaced by something more like the last government in Israel, there was tension between the two countries over Iran and Middle East policy under the last government. There'll be one under this. Um, so, to the degree again, in, in the U.S., um, the Republican Party is split. The Trump wing is. Pretty much as isolation, more more isolationist vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. Certain so doesn't want to get involved. You think of Rand Paul and people like that, where you even will have a certain edge, a kind of an anti-Semitic tinge. It's the Jews who keep dragging us into all these problems in the Middle East, and we don't want it. Um, and then you have the more internationalist Republicans who tend to actually see better prospects for working with the Saudis and so on, and would like to actually get back to order building in the Middle East. And then, you know, a, another group of Republicans who just like Israel, people like uh, Christians United for Israel and pe people like that who are a significant force. So the Republican Party is kind of debating with itself where it wants to go. The Democratic Party, by and large, isn't going to commit to a forward-leaning policy in the Middle East. So I think that's what's driving the relationship. Do you think that Iran then getting a bomb is inevitable in the near future? Well, I think if, you know, unless, if they want one, unless someone stops them, it is. You know, and if I want to be really depressed, I would think that something that Putin might enjoy doing uh, as a way to make trouble for the U.S. and the coalition against him is not he wouldn't even have to help Iran assemble nuclear weapons, which he certainly has the technicians and the information to do, or any of the other steps. He could simply start providing Iran with air defenses and fighters that would force a government in Israel to say, okay, if we don't act soon, we will lose the ability by conventional means to do anything in Iran. So you push Israel to that decision point, even while Iran is still some distance from the nuclear threshold. Um, and a nice crisis in the Middle East for Putin. You imagine the price of oil goes to $200 a barrel or something. That's good for him. Uh, you know, does that change the politics in Europe of energy? If you're not getting your energy from Russia and you're not getting energy from the Middle East because of some kind of emergency conditions. Um, you know, there's I, I, I struggle to find something bad in that scenario for Putin. It all looks good.
So uh, will he, you know, and that is a lot less costly for him than other forms of, uh, uh, of, of escalation or probing. And as we can see, the military cooperation between Russia and Iran has been, you know, accelerating um, as a result of the Ukraine war. So, you know, these, I, I, to me, these are the things that if I were an Israeli in Israel, I would be spending a lot of time thinking about and trying to figure out what to do about because they're quite consequential. So I want to ask one more question that will open up to our students here. Um, you know, part of BB Netanyahu's political doctrine has been working outwards in, as he says, but for a long time, the theory was you need to settle the conflict with the Palestinians, and only then would you be able to build right. relationships with neighboring Arab countries. And he's believed the opposite. And the Abraham Accords were in some ways evidence for, for his uh, his theory. Uh, those seem to be a bit at risk right now. Saudi Arabia, which was kind of, we were hopeful mm -hmm. that they could, they could establish relationships with Israel. They've now reestablished relations with Iran, uh, potentially soon with Syria. There's been some talk also of um, some potential discord between Israel and the UAE. Right. So do you think that the Abraham Accords are in peril? Um, and I guess the second question for that would be, what could Biden's role be in preserving okay. those? Well, I think the American-based order in the Middle East is in peril because the U.S. wants to withdraw from the region. And for the, you know, if you ask, you know, if you think about why would the Saudis or the Emiratis think the Abraham Accords were valuable. I mean, there, you know, there are a number of reasons, but the security argument would be uh, with U.S. backing, we have this grouping of countries really has the ability to deter Iran and by working closely with the Israelis. And then as we perceive the U.S. beginning to drift away, say in the Trump years, you have this crazy erratic guy who knows what he's going to do next. Um, you may like what he says today, but he will he can say anything tomorrow. And who knows who the Americans will elect next after him? They've demonstrated that they are utterly unpredictable and unreliable as a as an electorate. OK, um, so the idea would be that sort of joint lobbying, too, could help. So you get all the Arabs and all the Israelis in in Paris, in London and the U.S., you you know that that the Abraham Accords is suggesting a kind of a coalition that could you know that could work under certain conditions and be needed, but if the U.S. is so is clearly bent on leaving the region, then countries like the Saudis and the Emiratis really have no choice but to think, okay, what is life like in a post-American Middle East? Well, you know, prob no one else is going to really care about an Iranian bomb that much. Um, and we don't want to take them. We don't want to take on Iran without a superpower, especially an Iran that has relations with two nuclear superpowers. Um, so we need to start moderating our our turn. So, again, I don't think Israel did anything to sort of strengthen or weaken, in a sense, the Abraham Accords. I think they are a response to an international reality. And like, every, you know, the Middle East is a playground of real politikers. And when reality changes, the politique changes. So I think that's what's at work. Well, thank you for answering my questions. I get a lot, a lot of food for thought. So I want to open it up to our students who are here. Um, and yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. One question I have is about public definitely are experts, which is the U.S. Uh, stance towards Israel. And you've talked a little bit about, about it, military um, mm -hmm. matters in Iran. And specifically with regards to the reform, whatever's happening with the judiciary in Israel, um, can you lay out whether it's scenarios or a prediction for how the U.S. stance towards Israel might change if the country becomes increasingly illegal. Because my understanding of your yeah. position is that it's the, the, the ties between the nations aren't really financial, it's kind of historical and cultural, and there's many things going on. And if mm -hmm. like Israel completely undermines the Supreme Court and ceases to be a liberal democracy in the sense in which we know it, how what is the worst case scenario for the relations with Europe? Well, again, I would say look at Modi in India. He's actually achieved much of what Netanyahu would like to do. You know, he was he's been able to change the way the Supreme Court works in India, not 
you know, not through paper and laws, but just getting it to happen. And the relationship is fine. Um, Israel was a, you know, a nice liberal democracy in the 1950s, and the United States was supporting Nasser and the Saudis um, against Israel. So, you know, let's not be, um, you know, emotion, culture, all of this plays a certain role in the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, and it tends to make Americans often quite falsely look at Israel and see a mirror of their own society. And Israelis often quite falsely mirror their own things in, in the U.S., all right, fine, you know, we all do that, and, and there it is. But again, if the Biden administration believed that containing Iran in the Middle East was an absolutely essential piece of the American grand global strategy, we, you know, MBS, fine, you know, um, Israel, fine, all right? But if we don't think that, no matter how many you know beautiful supreme court things remain or how liberal israel becomes that's not going to make the united states more likely to risk a war with iran okay i think it does have something to do with the role you know views that much of the american jewish community will have about israel i think those those have been changing for some time and you know, they're actually reverting toward their historical norm. Zionism was quite unpopular among American Jews until the 40s. And uh, it has, you know, and, and we're sort of actually, a lot of what you hear now in the American Jewish community is very much like what you would have heard uh, before uh, World War II. And, you know, sort of, and and the whole concept of Israel as a, as a I would say that um, Judah Magnus, was closer to the views, the sort of instinctive views of a lot of American Jews about what they would like to see in Israel. That's that's going to be continuing. But again, the attitude of the American Jewish community um, has never really been the driving force in American foreign policy toward Israel. You know, that, um, you know, you can go back to the Blackstone Memorial, 1893. Do you guys know about this? This is before Herzl wrote Der Judenstaat. The sort of American Protestant establishment put together a petition asking President Benjamin Harrison to declare, uh, to use his influence to get the European countries to get the Ottoman Sultan to create a Jewish national home in Palestine. And this petition is signed by John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the American Jewish community didn't really want anything to do with this because they were caught up in kind of the reform Judaism idea of, you know, the Jews are not a people with a political destiny. We are citizens of whatever country we live in. One of the early Jewish American prayer books actually omitted the prayer for the return to Palestine um, as, as a kind of an expression of this ide ideology. So, um, you know, that so I think that, again, as I, as I looked at the history of American relations with Israel from 48 to the present, it looked to me as if the way to figure out what the relationship will be is to understand what the American leadership thinks its national interest is, what the strategy it adopts to achieve that interest is, how the Middle East fits into that strategy and how Israel fits into its Middle East strategy. If you do those things, you will get a pretty, you will come out at a pretty good approximation of what in any given administration American policy toward Israel is. So I don't, you know, so, so from that point of view, there'll be, an, there's, there's emotion because there's always a lot of emotion in the U.S.-Israel relationship, but fundamentally, if the U.S. thinks stopping Iran in the Middle East is a matter of vital national interest, we'll, you know, they won't, won't care all that much about Supreme Court decisions. If we don't think so, we, we, we still may not care from the standpoint of national interest, 
but we'll vent. And those may help us feel better about severing ties with an ally. Okay. Let's go around the room, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Um, so touching on your last point, I'm wondering what do you think was the main incentive or reason for the strong US support for Israel in the last 75 years or not 75. All right, right, right. Really, it really starts in 73. Right. You know, it starts with the Yom Kippur War. Again, um, and there were two reasons. One was um, it was clear that the Soviet Union was using the Yom Kippur War as a power move in the Middle East, which the U.S., you know, with oil prices, you know, all of the oil shocks happening and all of this didn't want to happen. And it's also clear that Israel had nuclear weapons. And if the Arabs were winning, the Israelis wouldn't sort of fold their hands peacefully and quietly die, but that there would be nuclear conflict in the Middle East, possibly Soviet retaliation. And even from the standpoint of just getting oil, that is worse than, you know, even an Arab oil boycott if you support Israel. So it was, you know, it's very clear cut. And again, it's after Israel wins the Six-Day War and after, over American opposition, it develops nuclear weapons that the U.S.-Israeli relationship becomes a major security relationship, okay? Then if we look for the rest of the Cold War, you know, Middle East is very important. Israel is very helpful in the Middle East. The sort of, you know, the, love, the the unspoken entente between the conservative Arab states and the Israelis meant that Americans didn't really tear our hair out very much over Arab-Israeli disputes. And furthermore, the peace process was this wonderful convenience for American presence. In a way, it still kind of is, even though it's so dysfunctional, that if president, if an American president wants to kind of, you know, if President Biden wants to build bridges to the right and to the Republicans, he can just make a speech and says, you know, Israel has the right to defend itself, and we Americans support that right. He's not spending a single dollar. He's not sending a single soldier into harm. He's doing nothing at all. But because it, there's this high emotional valiant, there, you know, oh, he's, he's standing up for America. And if, on the other hand, he wants to kind of, you know, the, the left is mad at him about even something else, um, he can say, I, the Palestinian, the needs of the Palestinian people are so transcendently important. And we, you know, he can. So, again, none of this costs him in resources, but its symbolic value in communicating to the American public is so large. So presidents have found this relationship relationship very, very convenient. Um, and you can just sort of watch them, uh, you know, making very tiny little tilts in actual policy that have disproportionately large, not only effects here, but in, in terms of the Middle East, the Arabs are really mad at something. Well, you say something about the Palestinians and the Arabs who don't really care about the Arab leaders who may not at all about the Palestinians feel like, okay, I've demonstrated to my people that I have an in with the president of the United States. I complain to the president and I get something. So, you know, it works for everybody, except maybe, you know, for some people. And then it, it, the same thing, by the way, with arms sales. In the 1970s, the U.S. really needed to sell a lot of arms to the Arabs. Why? because the price of oil was really high. We were still just coming out of the fixed exchange rate system. The balance of payments deficits were very difficult. The banking system was fraught. Arms sales are basically the way you can, you can balance your books really fast with really big arms orders. In times of recession and stagnation, they create a lot of jobs. You know, and then they create long-term dependencies because once they bought all their arms from you, they need like your technicians and your parts. And so you have leverage. Plus, they're more secure. And, and in the 1970s, suddenly we needed the whole Middle East to be very secure. Everybody wants that oil as the center of world politics. We need to be there. Okay, but at this time in the 70s, the American people hate the Arabs. They've just jacked up the price of oil, right? 
Uh, you know, and then they were sort of cowardly whining losers in the Six Day War and then sneak attack. They were just really unpopular. Um, you're not, it's going to be very hard to get approval for arms sales to the Arabs. Meanwhile, Israel was very popular. But again, the Israelis, if you start selling tons of weapons to the Arab oil states and Israel isn't getting any weapons, all right? Israel, you will not like what Israel does if you're an American president. They're not going to allow the Arab states to acquire stockpiles of weapons that could wipe out Israel. They'll do something. They've been they've done it before. They'll do it again. So you won't be pacifying the Middle East with these arms sales. You'll actually be stoking up crises unless you also arm Israel. But Israel doesn't have any oil. And Israel doesn't have the money to pay for basically to participate in an arms race that your policy choices are imposing on the region. So fine, the solution is you give financial aid to Israel to buy the buy weapons. You give them better weapons so they feel safe. But the better weapons you give the Israelis, the more weapons and the better weapons you can sell to the Arabs. So you actually... Are, you know, it works in American policy. It's not that, oh, the evil Israel lobby or those importunate American Jews drag us into something. They sort of looked, the, the Americans of that time looked at their situation and said, okay, this, and by the way, Kissinger, if you ever want an, an interesting experience, have Henry Kissinger fact check a chapter in your book that you wrote about his time in office. I spent hours on the phone with him. But he did say about this account of the arms race that it was absolutely what happened. That that describes the thinking. So what I'm saying then to your larger question is that look at American interest and you can see how it works. Israel becomes a super power, regional superpower in an era of tremendous importance. When Iran flips in 1979 from pro-American to anti-American, both Egypt and Israel rise in their importance in American policy. Up until 79, it was actually Iran had more American aid than Israel did. Um, after that, Israel replaces Iran, but Egypt also comes way up. And more recently, as Egypt has become sort of less of a great bet in terms of its capabilities, and the Saudis and the Emiratis have gone up, you know, we, we've moved it around. But it's 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 national interest as understood by American presidents of the time that really has driven it. Uh oh, you're in trouble. The state of Israel internally to, to try and ask for an advice. And people who see themselves in leadership in Israel the next few years, and people concerned about the relationships between Israel and American Jewry and America, what would be the focus and what would be a good advice? Okay, well, I mean, I think, you know, Ben Gurion needed to, you know, Israel had a very secular and leftist majority, clear majority in the early 50s. And Ben-Gurion gave the religious right more than it might have been able to get in an open political competition as a way of building the state or securing the state. Uh, I think now if I were would the Lord forbid in charge of Israel? Uh, I think I would. I would be thinking, all right, what does it take to make sure that even if the demographics in Israel continue to change, and the Haredi continue to have lower, very high birth rates, and so on and so forth, what does it take to make sure that liberal, secular Jews? feel safe and comfortable in this society and feel that they're not going to wake up one morning and have everything they care about just gone. All right. And 
you know, and I would I would lend, you know, go toward giving a little extra rather than trying to like, you know, push to the absolute extent the hardest bargain that I could because you want it to be a bargain that holds. Um, you know, what that means concretely in terms of legal stuff, it'd be very hard for me to say because this is this gets into where I just don't have the, you know, which clause of which basically, you know, I, I can't do it. I would think about a written constitution. Uh, I, you know, um, which in a sense includes a certain amount of judicial reform in it, because part of the, you know, part of the oddity is having uh, an unelected self, largely self-perpetuating Supreme Court in the sense they can veto. Um, you know, you say to an, an American, what would you think of our Supreme Court, the current majority could veto any new appointment they didn't like? People would, would think, that is batshit crazy. All right. So because, you, you know, it's you can't to an American, there's nothing more undemocratic than that idea. So in that sense. A written constitution, which both would limit the powers of the court to what the Constitution says they are right now, as far as I can discern, the Supreme Court in Israel can kind of just wake up in the morning and decide decide what it can and can't do. Uh, and it doesn't, it has some precedent, but really what only about 30 years since the 90s of this kind of work as precedent. So that's not very limiting. So I would look, for, but, you know, on the other hand, without a constitution, you just basically said the political majority of the day can, can completely change the court or overrule by one vote in the Knesset the Supreme Court decision, that's crazy too. That's, you know, so it's, it feels to me, it, and this is a very American thing to say, but it feels to me like Israel needs a written constitution that is debated and decided and provides the sort of rock solid guarantees that people want um, and, and has a path to amendment, but a very difficult path to amendment. Um, and that might be, now Israel right now does not seem to be in a calm and reflective mood for debating the fine points of constitutional theory, okay? But you know what? These things never happen when they're convenient. Actually, America, you know, if you go back and you look at how our constitution developed, it was not the most peaceful, happy time in our history either. So I think that's what I would be trying to aim at if I were trying if I were intervening in Israeli politics, and I would look be looking at different constitutional models. You know, I, I mean, I kind of like the American Constitution, but there's certain things about it that wouldn't work in Israel. You know, so much of our checks and balances is related to geographical diversity over a continental-sized country, so that when you have states' rights that checks what the center can do. That's much harder to do in Israel, which is sort of the equivalent of one U.S. state in area and population. So I would, you know, I would try to, I think that, it, and, and that offers to both sides some security. Now, the, the left has to give what some ground to the right um, you know, because in fact, you can't rule a country against the instincts of a demographic majority very well or very long. Um, and they're having the babies and they're growing. Uh, and there is a lot of bitter resentment related to the differential treatment of European and Mizrahi Jews early in the, in history and continue people have a chip on their shoulder and they're mad and so you know it's not going to be easy but this is where it would be interesting to see if people outside who are not in government but are kind of respected i thought herzog trying to do something was interesting but he may be too close to the center of of politics to really pull that off 
Yeah, yeah. It needs to, everybody needs to be at the table, including some of the people that, that you don't want at the table. And it would be like, you know, in, in America, the, the Trump people drive most people in places like Cambridge absolutely crazy. Uh, and, and there are good reasons why they do. But you can't, the United States can't simply ignore the sentiments of a large po political group in this way. And so compromise, what else, what else is there? Um, yeah. Many people think that the only reason Israel survived until now is because we left all the uncertainty of mm -hmm. the raising. And then every attempt in recent history to try to define things, but that's the source, of, that's the trigger. And I just wonder, like, it could be possible that it's not. Possible. Like they, they want to agree on, even on the most basic, lowest common ground. Like the first sentence right. is from us today. I cannot. I cannot imagine what it could be. Not to mention that the constitution. Yeah, the the no one knows. Not to mention that the constitution would finally define the conflict. <laughs> right. I can't even imagine. Or the borders. Or well, you know, states. our constitution does not actually define our borders. Many years and a lot of dial internal dialogue like, in groups and like foreign societies and all. Well, and it's <laughs> and, pain. And the, the, like the, the gap in the basic values, you know, what is yep. a, a woman like me at my age? Yeah, yeah. Very similar. We, we wish our children such a different future. Right, in the right. Most fundamental way. So even if we talk, it's just. Yeah, but this. So how can we? I, I think in some ways you, you're going to have to say, you know, you have to accept a kind of a principle of uh, everybody should have the right to live their own life, you know, uh, but that, you know, but that means there may be neighborhoods, in, but maybe not in every neighborhood at every moment. So you could have local government where within a certain territorial thing, the people can vote to adopt. X code and people who don't want that don't live there. Um, you know, it's it's about creating space mm -hmm. for different options. Because what else? Again, you know, that it's interesting to me. I, I come back, I was very impressed. I had not really studied um, Herzl's work or anything until I started researching this book. And I ended up spending a lot of time reading his diaries, which are absolutely fascinating documents. He was, he was kind of a buffoon in, in some ways, but also just, you know, eerily intelligent and, and, and visionary in others. And to me, the, the sort of core insight that Herzl had was that, you know what? The European Enlightenment and, lib and liberal values are wonderful things. But if you depend on them, they will kill the Jews. The Jews will die if they depend on liberalism. One of the, you know, and, you know, it's like all, there are these wonderful left-wing, Dreyfusard, Zola, these terrific people, and they're standing up in the name of common citizenship and secularism for us. And this is great, and I love them, but... They will, in the end, a tide of blood and hate is coming, and they will be helpless to help us. And we must look to other things to survive. You know, his vision of what the Jewish state would look like was it would be liberal. Uh, it was somewhat unrealistic in terms of how the Arabs would, uh, would receive it. But um, nevertheless, he absolutely did not think that that Western liberal values could be a foundation for the life of the Jewish people, um, and yet was himself in every possible way a liberal. Although a weird one. Do you know what the music was that was played at the first World Zionist con Congress? Wagner. 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 Yes, it was, it was from Tannhäuser. So um, 
you know, you could start you know, until quite recently, you could start riots in Israel by replaying the music at the first Zionist conference. So, you, you know, and so in that sense, as a if, if you ask yourself, what would a Herzlian Zionist do at this critical hour in the life of the Jewish state? OK, first and foremost is the preservation of the state is the core of everything, because without the Jewish state, the Jewish people do not have a future. All right. And so everything else must cede to that. And I think that I think that is very much the way Ben Gurion came at at things. It was also the way Jabotinsky came at things, even though they were, you know, fighting very hard. So, you know, it's that perspective. It's we must we must find a way to live together. One half of Israel can't boot the other half into the desert or the sea and still remain as a viable state. You need each other. All right. So that's what it's got to be. Is it easy? No. Did anybody ever say that being Jewish was easy? I, I never found that promise uh, written anywhere. Okay. I'm not Jewish, by the way, but that's how I understand it. My name is Ashish. I'm from India. Uh, oh, where in India? New Delhi. I was just there two weeks ago. But, uh, I mean, I've, I've, I used to go to the U.S. I've worked on the very facts in 2008, playing six rounds of track two. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think there's a case to be made I mean, first of all, I, I agree with the idea of the written constitution and power sharing and this and that. And, you know, I mean, even maybe secular Palestinians come to the rescue kind of a thing, right? I mean, because if they don't want to live under a theocratic state, I mean, there's, there's... But what is to be said for, I mean, we are just witnessing the logical conclusion or the logical pro progression of a state built on a... a theocratic framework, right? I mean, it's like, you know, Pakistan wants an Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Bangladesh didn't want it. Bangladesh is headed in a very different direction. At least half of Bangladesh is. The other half is not so yeah, sure. But, you know, it's, 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 it's not becoming a theocracy. I mean, it already isn't. It's moving in that direction, at least the, the northern part. So, you know, I mean, is religion alone a broad enough umbrella to include a whole range of values that people hold here. Right. And I think we are seeing the limiting effect of, uh, of that umbrella. Well, again, I, I think that I wouldn't call what's happening in Israel a logical culmination because I don't think the idea of a Jewish state is a theocratic concept. But to some it is. Well, but I think not, you know, neither to Bibi, you know, Bibi is, is you know, is more secular than I am, I suspect. Um, I, I once had a Jewish friend in the U.S. I said, so, so, Pat, how observant are you? She said, well, she says, let me put it this way. I don't barbecue pork on Yom Kippur. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that BB is probably close to that, especially if someone is looking, you wouldn't do it. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, and, I, and I think that national... I, Judaism is interesting in that it exists as both a national identity and a religious tradition, uh, which is, is somewhat unique, but one can see the historical process at work in it. Um, so, and so the Indian situation is actually quite different, just as Hinduism is such a different thing from Judaism. Um, you know, the BJP likes to talk about Zionism as a kind of counterpart, but really they're, you know, they're quite different. Um, Islamism, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, is as much of a theocratic project. But again, it's quite different. You know, for example, the, the fact that Judaism accepts ethnicity as a boundary in a way that Islamism doesn't makes it quite interesting. Um, so I, I, I guess what I'd say is that, yes, 
for a number of reasons all over the world, we are seeing a rise in um, you know, a, a, a shift among many people away from kind of rational, so-called rational, secular, enlightenment ways of thinking to more identity-based, irrational, communal ways of thinking, and away from economic logic to cultural logic. Um, and this is extremely problematic for a whole long list of reasons. On the other hand, people wouldn't be doing it if they didn't feel that there was something problematic about the the other way too. You know, I would argue that um, combination of, you know, since the 1940s with Hiroshima, we've all lived under this shadow of that human history could end in in an apocalypse with no divine intervention, whatever. We could simply blow ourselves up. And that as we've gone deeper into this era, more not only do more countries have nuclear weapons and there are more nuclear weapons, but there are a lot more ways for us to kill each other or kill ourselves, ranging from failing to deal with climate change in some people's minds to biological weapons of mass destruction to singular technical technological singular blah blah blah. So, actually, human beings today live in an apocalypse. Whether they are religious, whether they perceive it religiously or not, a climate activist is like it's the end times. If my side doesn't win the election and get these policies, humanity will die. And there's more of that happening, and that links up with a sense of cultural threat and endangerment that people feel through globalization, new kinds of information technology. So there is not just in India, not just in Israel, all over the world, human beings are feeling kind of an existential angst in a way that is sharper, I think, than in much of, of human history that we felt. And so they think with their emotions um, and they look to whether it's divine salvation or burying themselves in cultural, you know, immersing themselves in a comforting cultural surround. People are, are doing this. For the politician, one has to deal with, with the people one has. Uh, and I think, so I, I don't actually, in, in some ways I see what's happening in Israel, yes, as, as related to similar problems in many, in many countries. But I don't think, I think to sort of say, if we could just somehow get back to a secular economic focused way of thinking about things, all would proceed well. That might be true, but I don't think we can get back there. I think we are here. So who would oppose a written constitution reservation in parliament for? In Israel? Yeah. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm sure people will. You know, people will oppose, some people will oppose anything and the details will matter. But I think probably something like that is going to strike a lot of people as at least worth trying. And in some ways, as you, you know, to your point earlier, they've done this in the past, not by trying to do a whole comprehensive settlement of everything, but, you know, this law, that law in a way of carving different things out. So the religious have the divorce courts and the marriage stuff. But on the other hand, you can go to Cyprus and get a, you know, they're, they're like ways around things. You can do it in Cyprus to get in. Yeah, yeah, right. The way out. <laughs> yeah, the way out, yes, yes. Yeah. What I was trying to say, I mean, how can you be a liberal democracy and a theocracy? Right? Well, you can, I mean, it's, you, it's possible. Right. If, if the majority wants it, in a sense, I mean, what does liberal, you know, what is, what is the content of liberalism? Well, you know, I would say, you know, it's, you're always going to, every religion has its own attitude, sort of the concept of a complete break between church, synagogue, mosque, temple, or whatever, and state and is a very yeah. specific yeah. historical product of the Western Enlightenment. 
and as it's been received in various, you know, formal post-colonial countries, it has a it has a place, a sociological place in those. I feel like it's a little tough to put the same value judgment on all of that everywhere. And it comes in so many different shades. Or an opt-out, right? Well, this is, I mean, this is what I think if I were a secular Israeli, I, and particularly at this moment, this is why I'm saying I think I would look for ways of, you know, some people want this and it's important in some sense to the identity of an important constituent group of the state. Fine, they can have it. But some other people want something else that should be good. Right. But yeah, you know, but again, India is a much bigger, more diverse. Israel is very small. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, it's hard to do. I mean, it's like our whole system is built on compromises. Okay. Well, I think what, no, it's a good question. All right. It's a good question. I think what the right is now trying to, you know, there's a kind of sociological push by the Mizrahis and others and the religious um, who see the domination of a secular European liberal cosmopolitan elite. And they resent it because historically they felt like it discriminated against them, blah, 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 blah. Everybody has their thing. And this elite now holds power through certain institutions, justice ministry, the courts, and so on. And it absolutely intends to never, 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 never give it up, because if it did, it would lose what it considers the guarantees of its own safety. Plus, it genuinely believes, and not always wrongly, that the way it's doing things are necessary for the defense and preservation of the state. OK, so you have people who are both ideologically and sociologically committed to actually they want the Supreme Court to be undemocratic because they don't trust what the damn people would do with it. All right. And and that's the liberal position. OK, is is that the enlightened minority must rule the, the mass of sheep. That's the liberal position. All right. And and I I kind of agree with them that the things that they want are better for the country than what the other people want. But I also question how stable this is. And it's hard for me when it's challenged to say that the fundamental principles of democracy are being contravened when voters want to say and who's on the court. That doesn't actually seem so strange to me. So that's the impasse. Those are the interests that somehow have to be accommodated within the framework of a functioning state. Does that make sense? And it's, you know, if it were easy, it would have been solved a long time ago. But this is what, if you want a Jewish state in Israel, this is what you have to figure out. And I wish you success. But also, as you point, as some have pointed out here, there are the non-Jews in Israel, too, who are citizens and it's, you know, have rights. And there's the question of the territory. So it's, you know, it's just one puzzle inside the next, but that's also life. I think we're going to close here with that. Uh, Walter, thank you so much for your time and your thank wisdom. You. Uh, thank everyone here for your incredible questions and yeah. comments. Uh, thank you to uh, Alicia Gechter uh, here at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government for co-hosting this event. Um, and uh, just want well, you know, Walter will be speaking tonight at 8 o'clock at Emerson Hall, Room 101. So you're invited to come there. There'll be some time for Q&A then also. And then also at Harvard Hillel tomorrow at 8 p.m., Noah Feldman will be talking about uh, the judicial reform crisis. So Great. two upcoming programs that I, I hope you'll join us for. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you.